right to this word. Sometime later, read with me, will you? Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Somebody say, woo. That's a long time to be broke down, towed down. Let's keep going. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? I just feel called of God to just pause right there. Can you just look down your row and just make eye contact with somebody? You don't have to like them. You don't. It's not a long conversation. You ain't got to go to lunch with them this afternoon. But just, just look. Do you want to get well? You want to get well? Do you want to be better? Anybody just want to get better? I want to be better tomorrow than I was today. Let's get better. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. We're going to park it right there. Somebody punch your neighbor and say, you're going to get up today. You, you, you finna get up today. You finna get up today. I don't know what you've been down in and down about and down on, but today is your day. I'm, I prophesy over your life. Today is that you get up. Go ahead and give the Lord a praise in advance. Give him a praise in advance. Come on and bless him for what's about to take place in your life. My God. Father, we thank you for the word of the Lord. It is eternal. It is powerful. It is dynamic, life-giving on every level. Now breathe your word in this place. Bind up every demon who has come to steal and to snatch the word of the Lord. Father, we pray that you would cause your word to have such an impact in our lives that we would absolutely never be the same after this word today. Release it in us. Grow it in us. Change us. Awaken us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated in God's presence. The author, Stephen Otterburn, wrote a great book a few years ago, and he entitled it, Healing is a Choice. Getting well, getting better, changing, growing, moving forward is a choice. Nobody can keep you from being healed but you. If you are the same person you were five years ago, two years ago, belly aching over the same things, wallowing in the same pain, you largely did that by choice. And I know that's not good news, but the good news is you can change. You can heal. You can get better. And I'm grateful that God gives us the opportunity to heal. I love that this church is a healing place. It is a healing pool. Amen. We, I didn't know why the Lord gave me the vision statement, healing, strengthening, and equipping. That's what our vision is at Messiah Community Church. And you got to know where you are, by the way, because every church is not for everybody. Amen. But if you're broken, jacked up, toe up, from the flow up, like my pastor says, um, this is a good spot for you. This is a place where you can heal, where you can get better. We say healing, strengthening, and equipping people to make an impact in the world through faith in Jesus Christ. Your impact is related to your healing. The healthier you are, the more effective you are. Oh, come on and help me, somebody. 
the healthier you are, the more positive your impact on other people. And I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but some of us are not having a very positive impact on people. And it's not because you're a bad person, it's just that you're unhealthy. And some people don't know what to do with unhealthy. And so they avoid you, like the plague, because they keep getting from you. Is this too much for 10.30? I didn't give this to the 8 o'clock, to 8, 8.30. I'm going to give it to the 10 o'clock. But they keep avoiding you because you bring something into the situation every time you come, and they don't know what to call it, but it's unhealthy. The anger is not cute anymore. When it was a temper tantrum at two, everybody, ooh, ga, 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 ga. No, but at 42, it's not cute. <laughs> when you keep popping off the chain and going bananas when things don't go your way, that's not cute. You, my friend, have an anger issue. And you need the healing of God. The codependency is not cute anymore. When you had separation anxiety at two years old because mama was going to a meeting and you wanted mama not to leave you, that was cool. But at 40, you can't stand to be alone by yourself. And you keep circulating around into relationships that don't help you, but they hurt you. You, you, you can't stand the, the thought of being by yourself. That's not good. You're going to be all right by yourself. That is always there. But the truth is that we need healing from things that hurt us, people who hurt us. And we, we don't have to, to live in denial about what hindered us, what hurt us, what came against us. But we can't stay there for 38 years. 38 years is a euphemism for the idea that stuff stays with us for a long time, much longer than it really should. And I just want you to know that God has a healing for you. And, and you know, here, here at Messiah Community, you know, we're kind of a unique bunch around here. We are highly educated around here. Most people have at least one degree here. Some of y'all got seven. I don't, I don't get that. I mean, we prize education. We should. Most people make a good living around here. Most people got well manicured lawns. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, no, mine, I don't. <laughs> well, maybe the condo fees is taking care of it. But you get my point. My point is, we can have all of this going on, but many of us are still hurting and have unresolved matters in our lives that God wants to heal and he wants to fix so that you can move on. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to move off the whole healing subject, but I, I want to declare to you that today that somebody needs the courage to get well. You, it's time for you to pick up your mat and walk and to say, I'm not staying here anymore. I'm not going to live in this brokenness anymore. I'm not going to be the victim any longer. I'm not going to continue to make normal what is dysfunctional. Because there's some people who like, who like normalizing their madness because, and then everybody else is crazy. And that equation doesn't work in real life. Like, if everybody else is crazy but you, <laughs> somebody tell your neighbor, that doesn't work. It is no sin, by the way, to be hurt and to be wounded. It's not a, it's not a sin to be hurt. It's not a sin to be in pain. But when we settle for sick, I think that's a problem. And I'm saying sick, you understand what I'm saying. If, if I settle for it and if I begin to normalize it, if I begin to romanticize my mayhem and my madness, that's problematic. And I love what Jesus does when Jesus shows up at this place called the Pool of Bethesda. The text says, if you just come with me, it says sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Just in the interest of background, Jesus goes to festivals. He goes to what we might call holy convocations. We might call them religious conferences where religious people get together and talk about religious things. 
You talk about religious stuff, but don't nobody get better. But Jesus, out of a commitment to his faith, went to the conference. He went to the convocation. He went to the setting, to the service. But you got to understand, when Jesus shows up at a festival, it is not simply out of obligation to his faith. Because when he shows up at the festivals, particularly in the book of John, he always shows up and does something on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a time, a day of the week, where you were supposed to do no labor, no work. I was in Israel a few years ago. I'm I'm planning to go back this year. And it was amazing. We were staying in a hotel and on the Sabbath, which is Saturday there, I was tripping because when I went to get on the elevator, the button was already lit. It's like, no, 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 you don't, have, you don't, don't touch the elevator. You, you can't work on the Sabbath. There was only one elevator working in the hotel, and it just went up and down, and it stopped at every floor so that nobody would push the button on the Sabbath because there's no working on the Sabbath. So when Jesus shows up on the Sabbath, he shows up to remind people that he is the Sabbath, that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. And so he has a way of confusing people's paradigms about religion because he breaks the rules. My God, who am I preaching to in here? Somebody needs to shout, break the rules. You'll never get better if you don't break some rules. You've set up some rules in your life. You've set up some, some patterns and some standards in your life, and they work for you up to a point, but you haven't gotten better. It's time for you to break some rules in your life. My God, who am I preaching to in here? You... Jesus shows up to the Sabbath to remind them that he is Lord of the Sabbath and he's going to do exactly what concerns the will of God in your life. He's not concerned about rules. Text says, now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, not an uncommon word for us, but Bethesda, Beit Hesda, Beit means house, Hesda means mercy house of mercy. Jesus shows up in Jerusalem at the house of mercy. The writer says, John says, um, that he's there at this pool called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five colonnades or porticos or porches. We have an image of it right here. Let me, let me, this is a model. This is what it would have looked like. Notice that it is four sides, right, on on either side, two long, two short, and one in the middle. There are five sides with two pools. Sometimes people call it the place of two pools. It's significant because water was, was a scarce, and still is, a scarce commodity in Jerusalem. It's not like there, you know, like there's... um, like we have here, big wells, like you can dig a well and just get some water in your backyard. There, they depended on rainwater, and so the water uh, would, be, um, would run through an aqueduct, and it would fill the pools. John says that at these five porches, um, there were people who were paralyzed and lame and blind. They congregated, they gathered under the five porches, waiting for an angel to come and stir the water so that somebody, per chance, could get their healing. And so Jesus shows up here, and I love the fact, first, let me just, I got, I get, a, I get about two hours extra when I preach the 10 o'clock service. I like it. Um, Jesus shows up at places where religious folk don't show up. Come on and talk to me. I love it that Jesus shows up at the pool of Bethesda where all the lame and where all the paralyzed and all the blind are. There's a big religious feast going on and the Pharisees don't show up. Can I just, for somebody who needs this word right here, um, stop being bigger than you are. You're not too good to be around broken people. You're not too good to be around broken people or broke people. 
you're not so good that you can't, you can't have some community with people who are going through hard times. Why don't you bring your Jesus self to somebody's brokenness, to their community? Stop being better than everybody else. You're not. If Jesus, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the, the God of all glory was, was, was secure enough to show up where all the pain and the paralysis were, who am I? And don't get so cute at church that Pookie can't come. Uh, somebody knows exactly what I mean. And so Jesus shows up here and this man has been here for 38 years. And he, I love that Jesus singles him out. He notices him. He, 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 he's drawn to him. When he comes to this pool, he's drawn to this particular man. Of all the people sitting around here, how many of you know that Jesus is drawn right to you? Anybody ever feel like when the preaching is going on, the word just comes right to your chair? You blank out. You don't know who's sitting on your row. You done forgot who came in, what their names were, because Jesus showed up right on your row, right in your chair, to speak to your situation, to bless you, and to heal you. You ought to give God a praise that Jesus would show up in your situation, right in your space, speak a word right to you. He says, however, that this man who's been there for 38 years is an invalid. He is incapacitated. And I want to talk about why this man is not getting better. Can we talk about why he's not getting better? As I share with you why he's not getting better, just take the principle and evaluate your own story. The first thing in the text that I noticed was that uh, this pool is surrounded. It's surrounded by five colonnades, and five is the number of grace. It is the number of God's unmerited favor. The place is called the Pool of Bethesda, which is House of Mercy. But have you noticed that the House of Mercy has become a house of misery? Because the truth of the matter is, you can be in a place intended for your healing and actually get sicker. Oh, y'all not going to help me preach it here. Some of you have been to churches where you did not get better. You went, you felt more religious, but you didn't get better. You were surrounded by, you were surrounded by sickness. You were surrounded by, by brokenness. You were surrounded by people. They couldn't get better if they wanted to get better because there was nobody there helping them and pushing them. My God, this is so good. I'm a, I might have to come sit down and let somebody else preach it to me. The Bible says that, he, that this man was surrounded. He's surrounded. He should be surrounded by grace, but he's surrounded by religion because nobody's getting better. But more specifically, he's surrounded by infirm people. He's surrounded by other people who have no capacity. He's surrounded by sick people. And I'm here to tell you this morning that if you stay surrounded by sick people, you can never get better. Oh, my God, love on them, pray for them, bless them, send them, but don't surround yourself with them because if you do, you cannot get better. My God, who is this word for this morning? You, you got to understand something. Cynicism and negativism grows in an environment where everybody's sick. There's no forward outlook. There's no hope cast. There's no, there's no dreaming anymore. Sick people settle for sick. And this man is surrounded. Who are you surrounded with, by the way? Who's around you? What's the conversation in your life? Be careful. I, my God, if somebody needs to go to work and find yourself a corner where you can just go and talk to the Lord and get a word from God and plug in your headphones and get a word from your pastor for about 10 minutes on your break because you're surrounded by sick people on your job. And if you don't break out, if you don't get out, you will never get better if you stay in conversation with sick people. He's surrounded by sick people. 
And when you're surrounded by sick people, sick people, when I say sick people, these are people who have no intention of getting better. They like the idea. They like who they are. They like commiserating. Have you ever noticed how people who get high, doesn't matter what city you travel to, they can find the people who get high? <laughs> I've been, I've all, I was always amazed by that. Like, if you were, if you were a dope head, if you like to, you know, you... You like to gas up. You from Baltimore. How in the world can you go to Portland and find out where everybody else gasses up? Because misery loves company. I've watched people do it in church. They come to church. They look for people, I'm going to sit on the road with all of the negative people, all the people who just ain't got nothing good to say. This is my road. This is your road. Look, see, see who's on your road. Who are you? You might need to change your road on Sunday morning just so you can get healed and get some help and get better. Don't be careful who you surround yourself with because you can actually take in other people's madness. Somebody said, watch your surroundings. Find, your, find yourself some people who are getting better. He was surrounded. He was, but he was surrounded by, here's the next thing. <laughs> this man is surrounded by stagnation. The Bible says that they're at the pool of Bethesda. And at the pool of Bethesda, they wait for the water to be shaken, which means that the waters don't move very often. And wherever water pools and doesn't move, you have a problem because mosquitoes lay larvae in the water and bacteria grows in that water. And after a while, that water stinketh. <laughs> stagnant waters and stagnant people go together. And I don't know about you, but I don't have enough time in my life. I'm 51 already. I ain't got time in my life to be around people who won't move, who are not going anywhere. They don't want anything different. They can't embrace change. They just want everything to stay the way it's always been. Please, Pastor, don't change the church. The reason I planted a church is so I could move something. Ah, the reason I started a church is so we could shift some stuff. If I didn't want to move, I could have stayed where I was. They wouldn't change the carpets. They wouldn't change the paint. They wouldn't change. Everything was falling to pieces because nobody changed nothing. Leave it the way it is so we can all stay here and be religious. If you're going to make it at Messiah, dog, you're going to have to endure some change. If ain't nothing else happening around here, we're changing stuff. We're moving stuff. We're shifting stuff. We're turning stuff. Ain't no, listen, I, no, nothing I fear more in my life than being around people who won't grow. <laughs> I'm trying to hear the Holy Ghost lest I say something wrong. But I can't, I, can't, I can't be in a place of stagnation. I can't be in a place where, the, where I can't move, where I can't grow, where I'm not allowed to express new things and new ideas. Are you following what I'm saying? If, if you wanted the same old thing in the place where you used to worship, you should have... <laughs> Some people like it like that. <laughs> Let me keep going. Stagnant people... Stagnant water. You got to change your surrounding from stagnation. If you're going to get better, you need people who are moving forward, who are dynamic, people who are changing, who bring new ideas into your circle, who make you think differently and see differently. Even if they don't believe like you do, doesn't mean they don't have anything to offer you. The only people you're around are people who just say like the status quo. They bought the status quo. They want to keep, they invest status quo. 
That means they don't invest at all. They don't, they don't do anything. They just come, go, go back home, come, go. Want to go somewhere else? No, we're going to go back home. <laughs> I'm, I'm so grateful for my mom. Let me just say this to the next point. My mother is, she'll be 68 this year. Sorry, mom, I told your age. Get me later. Um, but my mother had me at 16. I was baby number two. And the only way for my mom to make it was to, to move into the projects, newly built projects in Norfolk, Virginia. But I love that my mother noticed the surroundings of the community and was committed to my growth, my ability to move forward in life. So she made it her aim by the time I got to middle school to buy her first home somewhere where I could get into a better school district. Oh, come on, help me preach up in here. Mama said, my baby's going somewhere. My sons are going somewhere. I got to change their surroundings because Lockjaw and them and Arnold. <laughs> my mama said, no, baby, you're not going to hang out on the corner under the street light, 9 o'clock on my watch. Mama, somebody said, change your surroundings. She got us away from stagnation. Here's the other thing that keeps people from getting better. Jesus asked this man what seems like an insensitive question. The Bible says, when Jesus, in verse 6, saw him lying here, lying there, and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you desire, do you want to get well? And I, I find it helpful and instructive that Jesus doesn't ask him, like, uh, bruh, how did this happen? How did this happen? What happened, man? Man, what's it like being here? Jesus said, I'm not concerned about any of that. Jesus was aware of what happened to him. He was aware of what hurt him. But he wouldn't spend the conversation on what hurt him. Who am I preaching to in here? Let's acknowledge what happened. Let's, let's acknowledge the impact that it had. But can we change the conversation now? It was bad. It was hurtful. It was painful. It was destructive. We acknowledge all of that. We wish that it had not happened. But can we have a new conversation now? And what I want to know now, Jesus says, is is it your earnest desire to get How long are we going to keep talking about what happened to you? They left you when you were two, and now you're 35. How long are we going to talk? Do you want to get well? It's such a piercing question that makes us have to examine, am I ready to step into this thing? 